arbitration practice marketing. So in this video, I want to share with you how you can start marketing your arbitration practice successfully. And this is not an easy area to navigate, which is why I'm going to take you from beginner level all the way to advanced level. And this video is going to be relevant for you if you're just starting out with building your arbitration practice, as well as if you're already actively arbitrating cases today. If you like this content, then make sure that you hit the like button and the subscribe button. It will help us build out this channel. And if you have any questions or comments, then put them down here in the comment section. Now, with that said, let's jump into the presentation. The first thing I want to mention to you is a really important one, because there is a big difference between building an arbitration practice and building a mediation practice. As an arbitrator, you're not facilitating the outcome, you're actually making the decision. And that changes the dynamics of how you can approach business development. This means that you, to a greater extent, need to factor in the relationships that you have with attorneys and other parties. As a result of this, many arbitrators will become paralyzed because they're afraid of breaking rules by engaging and interacting with attorneys and worried about making decisions and alienating referral parties. So does this mean that you're unable to do anything business development wise? Of course not. But what you are prepared to do and what you aren't prepared to do will be in direct correlation with the results that you get. So don't confuse basic visibility efforts with efforts that drive tangible results. Speaking at webinars, participating in events, posting on your blog and writing on LinkedIn may make you feel like you're keeping busy and that you are doing things that actually matters in terms of driving new cases. But the fact of the matter is most arbitrators won't get cases this way. Attorneys don't care about your latest post or your fancy website. What they do care about is if you're in demand by other attorneys, and what kind of relationships that you have with them and what kind of relationships they have with you. Now, the bottom line is it's a sliding scale. If you are unprepared and unwilling to do anything, then you will get nothing by way of results. But if you are prepared to do something actively, then that means that you have the possibility of obtaining results. So to make this a little bit more tangible, if the only thing that you're prepared to do is join panels outside of writing and posting and participating in events, then chances are that you're not going to see much results in the short term or even in the medium term. No one is actively going to seek you out if you approach business development this way. But if you, however, are willing to expand your network with new referral parties and leverage your existing contacts, then chances are that you're going to be able to significantly increase the number of cases and referrals that you're getting, both from attorneys and panels. And I'm sorry to say there is no checklist here that you can use. There's no template or magic formula. What you will and won't do will ultimately come down to two things. Number one, any local rules and regulations that you need to take into account. And number two, what you are comfortable doing. Now, let me explain this further. There may be rules applying to arbitration panel members which would prevent you from directly engaging with attorneys. And there may be laws which would prevent you from doing so in some jurisdictions. So you need to do your own research on what applies to you in your immediate geographical area and for the panels that you are a member of. And then finally, you also need to determine what you are comfortable with doing and what you're not comfortable with doing. But I can tell you this, we work with hundreds of clients and many of them are arbitrators and they approach business development the same way as many of our mediator clients do. Some common questions that we get revolve around upsetting attorneys and alienating attorneys. Unfortunately, this is part of the game. You can mitigate some of this with your professionalism, but ultimately, sometimes your decisions will work out into an attorney's favor and other times it won't work out in their favor. Many attorneys will be okay with that, but sometimes some are going to get upset and they may or may not agree to using you again, sometimes for a very long time. So this is all the more reason for you to take control and actively start working on your business development. Ensure that you have a lot of sources of business and you're not only reliant on certain panels and certain individuals. And most attorneys will actually come back to using you again, even if they've stopped doing so for an extended period of time. Ultimately, nothing good will come from you overthinking this. 
So one of the best ways of approaching this and learning how to navigate this landscape is interacting with other arbitrators. And I'm not talking about chatting with arbitrators that are in the exact same position as you are today or the ones that built their practices long ago. And these two categories may make up the majority of your peers. What I'm talking about here is engaging with arbitrators that are in the same position as you are, but they're now actively and successfully getting more cases through business development efforts. This is the main benefit with belonging to a group. And if this is something that you're interested in, you can join one of our programs, which means that you immediately get access to a global group of peers that can provide you with relevant and up-to-date information. Now, when it comes to building your practice today or getting more cases in today's competitive environment, where pretty much every attorney that gets close to retirement or every former judge wants to become a mediator or arbitrator, it really does pay off to have access to a group like this. And even though it may be helpful helpful for you to speak with people that built their practice 10 to 20 years ago and are very successful today, it's very, very likely that the ways that they were able to build their business back then is not going to be successful in today's environment. So let's talk a little bit about your expectations. So the first thing that you need to understand is that there's going to be a lot of ups and downs in your journey of building the arbitration practice that you want to have in the future. Even under the best of circumstances, it's likely going to take you quite some time to get all of the cases that you want to from all of the referral parties that you want to. How soon you will get cases really comes down to three different things. Where you start out today, the effort you put in, and the quality of the work that you put into these efforts. And let me explain this a little bit further. So the first thing that you need to ask yourself is, are you already getting cases today? If you are, it's likely going to be easier for you to get more cases. Next, we look at whether you're able to charge for cases today or not. If you're getting only pro bono cases or cases where you are able to charge a reduced fee, then that is fantastic. That's a stepping stone. But it is even better if you're able to charge fully for your cases today. And then finally, if you are getting direct referrals today from attorneys or in the situation of panels where attorneys actively are choosing you, then you are in the best position of obtaining more cases. If these attorneys are presented with a list and you're a name on that list, again, that's something that's good, but they're not actively making a choice on putting you on that list. So the best possible situation that you could be in today is if you're getting cases and you're getting cases based on attorneys actively choosing you. That's the absolute quickest way to get more business. If you are not getting any business today, then naturally it's going to take longer. If you are getting business, but it's based on reduced fees, then it was likely it will be quicker, but it's still going to take you a little bit of time to build up a healthy flow of cases that you're able to charge fully for. And then finally, if you're getting cases from panels where no one's actively choosing you or putting you on that list, that's still very good. That's a building block, but ultimately the best position that you could be in is if you're actively being chosen and attorneys are putting you forward for cases. Now, let's talk a little bit about geography. We often get questions such as, will this kind of business development work for me because I'm based in this or that country? And we'll also hear the same thing when it comes to cities. Will I be able to use this system to grow my arbitration practice when I'm based in New York? Will I be able to grow it when I'm based in Los Angeles or when I'm based in Oklahoma or in Berlin or in London? Now, naturally, there will be nuances that you need to take into account depending on where you're based. But in our experience, pretty much in all cases, the same building blocks apply. There may be situations where you're able to enhance your practice and your business development efforts based on location specifics, but that's really a second order focused area. 80% plus of your results are going to come from applying these standardized building blocks that are slightly tweaked to your unique situation. 
And the reason why I mention this is that so many arbitrators will think about how they are different, how their practice is different, how their location is different. The vast majority won't actually be different. When you have a steady stream of referrals coming in from multiple referral parties and panels, then potentially you can start thinking about how you can elevate your practice through location specifics. And we do know what we're talking about here. We have a global clientele and we know that these building blocks apply and they work in all geographical areas. Now, the second common question that we get is, what strategy should I use? Because I'm focused on human rights. I'm focused on employment. I'm focused on something else, real estate, construction. And I think you can guess where I'm going with this. Naturally, your niche and practice area does matter, but it rarely matters from a business development perspective. Our experience from working with hundreds of clients, arbitrators all across the world, we know that the same building blocks apply. So don't occupy yourself with trying to figure out how your arbitration practice is different because it won't be. There will be time for you to start thinking about niche specific strategies when you have a healthy stream of cases coming in recurringly from a wide range of sources. And now you may be wondering, why doesn't location and practice area matter? Well, the simple answer is you're always going to be interacting with other people. You're always going to be interacting with attorneys on the other end. And what determines how many cases you get is a direct function of your visibility and your relationships. And developing relationships is no different depending on if you're based in Australia or in England or in the United States. It won't change if you're focused on employment or if you're focused on construction or real estate. So let's get down to business. Let's talk about how you can get more cases and referrals for your arbitration practice. And these examples will be applicable to if you're just starting out as an arbitrator today and you have zero cases, it will be applicable to if you're trying to transition out of full-time employment or a full-time law practice into arbitration. And finally, it will also be applicable to if you're already a full-time arbitrator today and you're interested in getting more cases and more referrals. And please remember that these building blocks apply to the vast majority of practices. Now, naturally, there will be differences between a local city-specific arbitration practice focused on employment arbitration compared to a practice that is focused on international banking disputes. So what we're going to cover here are three different levels, the beginner level, the intermediate level, and the advanced level. And the reason why we do this is just to show you how to do it properly, because so many arbitrators will approach this the wrong way, because how they approach building their practice is often derived from their experience as working as in-house counsel, building their own law practice, or having some other full-time employment or occupation. And the dynamics of the arbitration ecosystem is entirely different than most of these other areas. The easiest way of explaining this is that as an arbitrator, you will not obtain direct business, if you will, from one single entity or one single person. Your business will come on the back of referrals from attorneys, often one or two attorneys, but it could also be multiple attorneys involved in a case, multiple attorneys and multiple parties involved. They will choose you based on their relationship with you, their experience in working with you previously, and or how much in demand you are by other attorneys. Another big difference between mediation and arbitration is that as an arbitrator, you're also able to obtain business from other arbitrators. So they could select you to serve together with them on an arbitration panel. So from that perspective, it also pays off to have visibility and relationships with other arbitrators. So let's get back to the evolution of business development. And just to explain this taxonomy, this relates to where you start out today. So if you, for example, have no cases, then you will start off at beginner level, but you're able to quickly move through beginner, intermediate, and to advanced, even if you only have a few cases. So you don't have to get a lot of cases to be able to operate at advanced level when it comes to business development. 
So let's start off with beginner level. The first thing that you need to do is ensure that you have a commercially viable offer. And by that, I mean, you need to know whether the services that you provide in the arbitration space are in demand. Now, very often you're going to be operating in areas where there are already other arbitrators active. So you will know that this is an area where there is demand for those sort of services. But if you're trying to develop a new area, you need to be aware of the fact that it can take a lot of time, money, and energy. And that's usually not the best starting point if you're trying to establish yourself as a new arbitrator. In the beginning, it's also going to be easier for you to get cases from panels rather than getting them directly from attorneys. So to make sure that you join different kinds of panels where you can do pro bono work, where you can do reduced fee work. And obviously, if you're able to join a panel and get paid in full, that's obviously the best outcome. Getting on these panels will allow you to build up your experience, build up the number of cases that you worked on, which will allow you to join other panels. And then finally, it will also allow you to start building relationships through direct interaction with attorneys. And when you're starting out, you also want to make sure that you learn from other arbitrators. You can do this in several ways. One of them is simply to follow other arbitrators on LinkedIn, read what they post about, see how they interact with other attorneys, but you could also take it one step further and develop and cultivate direct relationships with arbitrators and engage with them one-on-one. -on -one. That way you're going to be able to learn even more about how you can become a successful arbitrator. The results of your business development involves not only around your visibility and your network, but also on how successful you are in your role as an arbitrator. And that's something that you're only going to be able to learn through experience and also in direct interaction with other arbitrators. At this stage, you also want to make sure that you start developing your visibility. This means that you should have some kind of footprint both on and offline. This could involve building out your website, making sure that you have a LinkedIn profile and any other areas that are relevant to your particular practice. You should also start doing basic networking by engaging directly with the individuals that ultimately will provide you with business. So we're not talking about your peers here. We're talking about attorneys. So try to build out your network. This will not necessarily immediately have the effect of them providing you with business, but it will give you an opportunity to better understand them and understand what drives them and what drives the decisions that they make. For example, why do they decide to work with certain arbitrators and others not. In all of your interactions, whether it be you working on an arbitration or not, you want to make sure that you deliver value. That will ultimately be the best currency for you. And please keep these three important things in mind. Do not expect your peers to provide you with business, especially not initially. Later on, when you're more established, other arbitrators may decide that they want to work with you. But for the most part, you will be seen as competition. So don't spend all your time networking with your peers because that's not going to help you get more business. Secondly, don't expect to get business from any other area than what I just mentioned. Keep your eye on the ball and don't get confused with side projects such as spending a lot of time and money building your website because ultimately your website is not going to get you more business. That's a place where people go to to find out more about you when they've already heard about you. And don't do anything unless you know that you have a commercially viable offer. That will always be number one. Now let's move on to the intermediate area. At this level, you will already have started getting cases and you will have some experience. So you want to make sure that you join panels where you are able to charge fully for your services. You should also start using LinkedIn here for communication purposes. This will help you with building out your visibility and also stay top of mind with referral parties. You should also be active both on and offline. This means that you can participate in events, you can speak at panels, you can do other types of speaking engagements, both on and offline. You may write columns, you might may write a book, you may decide that you want to teach, all of these different areas will help you with your visibility, but they will typically not be direct drivers of business for you. They would rather work as a supporting effort to what you do in the networking space. 
And that takes us to the fourth point, which is one of the most important ones. You want to make sure that you expand your network, both on and offline. And by that, I mean both in the online space as well as in person with clients and referral parties. And if you already are getting direct referrals today, or if you have individuals in your network that are particularly well connected, you want to make sure that you leverage those connections to ensure that you're able to get more direct business and also more indirect business. And as always, the final point, deliver value in all of your interaction. Now, this may not be as obvious as it seems because doing a good job is something that you obviously should focus on, but it could also mean that you deliver value both in the business as well as in a non-business context. And then finally, the advanced level. Now, most people, they are not at this level. And this is where we spend most of our time with our clients on taking them to this level and making the most of this level. And the easiest way to explain this, even though you're active in your business development efforts, people end up coming to you. You have sufficient visibility to pull people in. Your business development efforts are so finely tuned that you don't come across as needing any business and people are pre-sold on your capabilities. At this level, you're able to leverage your existing network so that your network and your relationships network on your behalf. Advanced network expansion strategies. Precise and purpose-built activity that will allow you to connect with the right referral parties at scale. And scale is important because it will improve your chances of success. Advanced contact cultivation strategies. You don't get to know someone by sending them an email once or a LinkedIn connection. The better the strategy here, the more naturally you can take someone from a completely cold contact to someone that you're doing recurring business with for a long period of time. Visibility strategies. Posting on LinkedIn and your blog and doing other types of visibility efforts are great, but there are ways for you to do even more when you understand how, for example, LinkedIn's engine works and how you're able to expand your footprint in the online space. We work with our clients on high impact strategies for expanding their visibility, both online and offline location and niche specific strategies, because at some point you may want to branch out or zero in on a specific niche. You may want to go statewide, national, or even international in your practice. And the strategy behind such an effort will differ from that of one with a local focus. And then finally, deliver value. We keep coming back to that. Always deliver value, both in a business and a non-business context. And finally, let me leave you with these three points on how you're able to create success for your practice. The first thing that you need to do is ensure that you have patience because this won't happen overnight. You need to allow for a certain amount of time to be able to build out the visibility and the relationships that's required for you to get plenty of cases, recurring cases, and also cases from a wide range of different sources. That's how you ensure longevity for your practice. The second point is consistency. It's much more effective for you to do this kind of business development work every day, a little bit every day. That always beats bursts of efforts once per month or once per week. And then finally, incremental efforts. What you will see is small efforts of 30 minutes per day will build up over time. And pretty soon you will have a snowball effect in your business development and case generation. So that's everything that I had for you in this video. I hope you found this content useful. If you did, make sure that you hit that like button and the subscribe button. And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future videos, then put that in the comment section. We love to hear from you. Thanks very much for listening in and I see you in the next one.